Greetings in the Lord, Harvard UCC. My name is Kelly Ward, formerly Kelly Green, and I am the grandchild of Doris and Wilbur Polly, who um, were faithful members of your congregation. So I um, send gratitude and thanksgiving for the opportunity to be with you in this way today um, and look forward to diving into our scripture with you. Um, so let's do that. And in our scripture text this morning, we meet Elijah the Tishbite, who is soon to be a great prophet. And in this text, we meet him for the first time. And Elijah immediately proclaims to Ahab, king of Israel, who through his worship of the god Baal had done more to anger God than any other king of Israel before him. Elijah proclaims to him that there will be a drought in the land. The word of the Lord then tells Elijah to retreat and hide by the Wadi Cherith where God would provide water and food from ravens. In other words, Elijah's life was in great danger, as he had likely deeply angered the king by pronouncing drought. When Ahab, King Ahab, believed that this god, Baal, was the god in charge of life and death and of rain and agricultural prosperity, the god of fertility, by killing Elijah, King Ahab could cut off the message of drought deny the God of Israel power, and ensure that this drought would not occur. Or so he thought. But the word of the Lord comes to Elijah with another plan. And trusting in that plan, Elijah does as God commands and seeks refuge in the wadi. And a wadi is a bed of a stream in a valley where it is usually dry, except for in the rainy season. The provision of water from the wadi for Elijah is truly a miracle, as the rest of the area is in a drought. And it's a miracle when Elijah receives food from the ravens. And the ravens are normally considered an unclean bird, according to Levitical code. God provides for and keeps Elijah safe amid drought and danger. But after a while, the wadi dried up because there was no rain in the land. The concept of having no rain in the land is not foreign to those who live in Nebraska or those who call Nebraska home. Um, it, right now is a time of drought. It's been very sad to see that parts of the state have experienced fire and intense heat, extreme heat in this season. So the concept of not having rain is common to us. Um, drought is common. Um, and I also remember while I was in seminary, a few years ago when a cyclone winter storm hit large parts of Nebraska and raised river levels by over eight feet, flooding hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland and thousands of homes, leaving people displaced in many places and livestock as well. Remember at that time, bridges broke, streets were inaccessible, and people were seeking refuge in largely a rural state where there's miles in between towns. Um, the opposite of a drought, this flooding left many people in a state of scarcity, as a lot of material belongings were destroyed. Houses and cars and farming equipment were in need of great repair, if not irreparable. Whole fields of crops, the livelihoods of many farmers, were destroyed. And food and clean water were limited at that time, if they were available. The land was overwhelmed because there was too much snow melting at that time, and it melted too fast. It was too much rain for the land. So we see these two sides of drought being there's not enough rain for the land and what Elijah was experiencing in this passage. And we've seen in our home state how too much rain too fast caused extreme flooding. So in this text, the word of the Lord comes again to Elijah and tells him to go to live in Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon and is out of King Ahab's territory. For the Lord has commanded a widow there to feed Elijah. The Lord had provided for Elijah while he was hiding, and now the Lord has declared a new source of provision in the widow. So Elijah goes, again trusting that God will provide, and comes to the widow and asks for a drink. The widow does as he asks and goes to get him water, but before she can even give it to him, Elijah asks for bread. The widow responds with an honest recognition of her scarcity, seeming to call on God herself 
saying, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks so that I may go home and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. We can imagine a lot of different questions running through the widow's head at this point. Who are you? Who are you to ask me for food when all that I have to give to my child, who is starving and dying, I give to my child? I don't even know you. What do I owe to you? Can't you see that we don't have enough? That we're doing what we can to survive? But our scripture tells us that God commanded the widow to feed Elijah. And maybe she had known this command already, or maybe it took the next verse, God's word and command coming through Elijah, saying, Do not be afraid, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of meal will not be emptied, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. Fully aware of her scarcity, but fully obedient to the word of God, the woman feeds Elijah and then lives in abundance. That word of God frees the widow from her fear and enables her to act in faith, trusting God's promise shared by this messenger and the jar of meal and jug of oil do not run out. I remember at that time of the floods in Nebraska when I received a text from a family member, which was a photo of a gravel road completely flooded. That gravel road leads out to the farm where her husband cares for cattle, and he was letting her know that while some cattle had died in the flooding, he was safe. He was also flooded into the farmhouse and would have to stay there to save more cattle for the next couple days, or at least until the road was drivable and conditions were more stable. (sighs) Hannah told me that she and my niece were making the best of being home alone in town, and they were stress baking while praying for the communities around them. Much of the town was flooded and the grocery store was closed. But Hannah had some canned food in the kitchen and would be just fine. Her neighbor, on the other hand, an elderly woman who relied on her daughter to bring her food most days, was without and needed some basic food items during the storm. Adam, out at the farm, had very little food on hand. And as he scavenged for food, he thought of their neighbor and called Hannah to make sure she took their neighbor a couple meals. While experiencing the scarcity himself, Adam recognized the scarcity in another and encouraged Hannah, who could provide, to do so. And while this is not a story of God miraculously turning scarcity into abundance, it may have been a small miracle to this woman, who, expecting to wait out the storm with nothing, was given more than she imagined. Perhaps God provided what she needed through her neighbor, as the widow provided what Elijah needed to him. It is much easier to talk about trust and confidence in God's goodness and provision in the face of doubt than it is to live it. When Elijah was subject to danger and death, God provided a safe place and miraculous provision. When the widow had lost all hope for herself and for her child, God provided for her every need. When the elderly neighbor had expected days of loneliness and hunger, God provided a neighbor and a warm meal. Elijah proclaims the most common command in the Bible in this passage when he says to the widow, do not be afraid. The good news, friends, is we can hear God's word encouraging us not to be afraid. For as material items may wash away, and drought may soak the life out of many things. Our true life, our true hope and nourishment is found in God, who has sustained us and will continue to sustain us forever when we live in union with God. Even in the midst of drought or flooding or danger or a pandemic, God, our creator, will be with us and will care for us and will sustain us. The story of Elijah encourages us to share this message. 
that because God is near to us in small and large miracles and even reveals himself in the life of Jesus, we do not need to be afraid. We do not need to fear our neighbor or put up walls or stock up our own goods. There is enough. We worship a God of abundance rather than scarcity. And the widow encourages us to listen for the word of God, to act boldly in faith, trusting in God's promises. God provides through the widow, who shares what she has when she has close to nothing. And God calls us to share our abundance with others. May God give us hearts to love one another, so that in giving and sharing and receiving, we too may experience the steadfast love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.